and welcome to the American School of Classical Studies at Athens. We're here today on September 29th to commemorate the 2500th anniversary of the epic naval battle that changed the course of human history. It was the fateful day when the Persian King Xerxes watched as his mighty fleet was decimated by a much smaller allied Greek navy in the narrow straits between the island of Salamis and the Greek mainland under the brilliant command of the general Themistocles. We will soon be hearing in detail about this battle from an eminent ancient historian, Professor John Hale, who is the author of the best-selling book, which we have here, <laughs> entitled Lords of the Sea, the Epic Story of the Athenian Navy and the Birth of Democracy, which was published in 2009. Now it's my pleasure to welcome Professor John Hale, who is joining us from the University of Louisville, where he is the Director of Liberal Studies and a Professor of Archaeology. His archaeological work is largely underwater. He has collaborated with the Institute for Nautical Archaeology on shipwrecks throughout the Mediterranean from Portugal to Alexandria, Egypt. He has written for many journals, including the Scientific American, on such topics as the Viking Longship and the Art of Rowing. Many of us academics can trace our inspiration to a teacher. And in John Hale's case, it was an undergraduate class on Greek history at Yale. When the professor found out that he was a rower, he told Hale to study Athenian naval history from the perspective of the rower's bench, that is, on a trireme. There began his life work on ancient warships and the importance of the Athenian Navy, culminating in The Lords of the Sea, published in 2009. In this book he has written, without the Athenian Navy, there would be no Parthenon, no tragedies of Sophocles or Euripides, no Republic of Plato or politics of Aristotle, end quote. And without the victory at Salamis, which took place nearly 2,500 years ago, we would not be where we are today. Please, uh, when the lecture is over, submit your questions. You can actually do this at any time via the chat or Q&A tab, and we will get to them after Professor Hale's 30-minute presentation, which starts now. Thank you. Today we commemorate a most important turning point in the history of the Western world, a great battle between the forces of the King of Persia coming from the east and the navy of the city-state of Athens in Greece, supported by other Greek naval forces in the narrow waters between the coast of Attica, the land of Athens in Greece, and the island of Salamis offshore. After that island and those narrow waters, this has come to be known as the Battle of Salamis, waged between the forces of King Xerxes of Persia and an alliance of Greeks trying to prevent the intention of the Persian kings from reaching reality, their belief that they should continue to fight and campaign until the limits of the Persian Empire were the same as the limits of God's own sky. The ship that prevented that dream com from coming true, you see before you in a moment, it is the trireme of ancient Athens, which we will see was had been built in its hundreds only shortly before this battle in time to prevent the Persian takeover of the Western Greek world. Triremes mean rowed by three oars. Those are the oars coming out of this trireme replica of our own time. Those are the top tier of rowers, the Thranites, who you see there. And you see the oar ports of the lower uh, group, the Thalamians below. And the, the, very faintly you see the, the Zugitai oars coming down in between the two. Let's go back to our initial image. That is called the Lenormand relief on the left. It was found in, in, in Athens 
And uh, by archaeologists, it's become our only snapshot of one of these Greek triremes in action with the, with the rowers at their oars. And these, much more than the armies, these rowers were the Westerners who saved Greece and the entire Western world of, of Europe and North Africa from complete takeover by this great empire of the East, the Persians. The Athenians have been commemorating this great victory in their waters ever since. Uh, let us take advantage of this new erection they have made, a monument above the battle site at Salamis, showing the military complement. We remember there are 170 rowers on board the ship, but what you would have seen in a battle were those on the deck, and there would have been a mere 10 hoplite warriors, H-O-P-L-I-T-E, that basically means men of gear, and in the right there you see all of their gear. A great shield, half the size of themselves, a long spear with both a bronze point and a spear butt spike at the other end, and those greaves, those, those shin guards, as well as a helmet that would have covered most of their face. They were aptly called men of bronze because once they swung their shields in front of their bodies, they were bronze to you, the enemy, from the, the earth ankles right up to the top of their heads. The historian of this Greek and Persian war that we follow today is Herodotus of Halicarnassus. He was born a subject of the Persian king because Halicarnassus and its queen Artemisia, who will be the only female combatant in this battle of Salamis that we are commemorating, they were part of the Persian king's empire. They had been conquered as long ago as the time of Cyrus, the founder of the Persian empire, way back more than half a century before the battle of Salamis itself. So Herodotus grew up with Persian affiliations, his home city, but then leaving Halicarnassus and moving to the Greek world, he became a man of all worlds. And his, his histories are a remarkable effort to try to give the Persian side of the story under their great king Cyrus, Cyrus's son Cambyses, then the subsequent king Darius and his son Xerxes, and show them in their conflicts with the Greeks. This is the beginning for us in the Western world of what we call history, borrowing Herodotus' own term historie, which means researches. Here we see an image of Xerxes. He is presenting himself as his father and his two successors, Cyrus and Cambyses, would have done as a warrior king. But Xerxes was the first of those three monarchs to be born in a palace. He had not had to fight his way through to the throne. He had not added great areas to the Persian Empire itself with his own spear, the, the, the emblem of the, the, the Persian monarchy. So he was very much someone living in these grand palaces and not accustomed to leading armies. But when his Western Front blew up in trouble, in rebellions from these Greeks, both within and without side Persian domains, he had to take up the spear and lead his forces on land at sea to punish those Westerners, those Greeks, and above all, the Athenians, for what they had done to hurt his people. He went on an epic march, which fortunately for us, the, the historian Herodotus describes in detail. And on this map, you can follow Xerxes' route starting over there in the, the west of what we call Turkey, the landmass of Anatolia, at the great city of Sardis, the mustering point where all the forces came together and the red dotted line takes him north to the, the Bosporus and Hellespont, the waters that separate Asia from Europe and, and leave the waters of the Black Sea into the Aegean. He had a huge army to get across and partly just showing his people could walk on water if the king commanded it, his engineers, the royal corps of engineers of the Persians, built a pontoon boat and the whole Persian army marched, marched across it. They then followed the coast so they could keep pace with his 
enormous fleet, his armada of a kind of ship called a trireme, rowed by three levels of oars, as we will see, and parallel to each other, army on land, the fleet at sea, make their way around the northern Aegean through the, the, the little canal that had been cut for them by Xerxes' same Army Corps of Engineers, so they could row as if magically through dry land, through that Athos Peninsula, which is the northern peak of this traversal, and that was to avoid the dangerous cliffs at the southern point where some of his father's ships had actually suffered a shipwreck. They then pass on around, past Macedonia, down the coast of, of, of Greece, and they are held up for three days by, in the parallel march of the Persian army, with Xerxes at its head, they are held up for three days at a place called Thermopylae, the Hot Gates, named because it was the gates of central and southern Greece, and there were hot springs nearby. This was the, the, the place for holding the pass by Leonidas, king of Sparta, and his 300 Spartans and 4,000 other Greeks. They failed after three days when the Persians found a way around the past, took them from the rear, and then proceeded after the death of Leonidas and his, and his Spartans down toward their ultimate objective, the, the Athens, because it was the Athenians, not the Spartans, who at an earlier stage had crossed the Aegean and helped the Ionian Greeks on the eastern side of the Aegean, who were the Persian king's subjects at that time, to rebel. Persian kings never forgot, they never forgot the Athenian aid to that rebellion on their territory, and in their view, this entire invasion of Greece had been provoked by the Athenians. This was a simple reprisal, an insurance that such an invasion of their territory could never happen again. And their territory was huge. It ran all the way to the Indus River in the east, what we would call Pakistan today. And it included territory right up close to the steppes of Russia and all of Egypt, all of what is today what we call Mesopotamia, modern Anatolia, Turkey. And they had already crossed over under Darius, Xerxes' father, and captured parts of northern Greece and Bulgaria. It just seemed in inevitable that Athens and its fellow southern city-states of Greece, like Sparta and Corinth, would go the same route. They too would be inevitably absorbed in this unstoppable imperial realm. And to look close up at the, the, the map, we see modern Iran there, to give you some orientation in the modern world. And now let's, let's come over to the, the cockpit of war for Xerxes period, and we can see Asia Minor and the point of crossing over then into Greece. Now, he, the Persian king had started years before to plan this immense march. He had assembled the largest army his empire had ever put together, but by a strange miracle, we can only call it that, on the western side, the Athenians, three years before this fateful battle of Salamis, had made an important discovery of their own. The Athenian land is called Attica. In the southern part of Attica was a mountain called Laurion, and that means silver mountain. And in that mountain were veins of silver which had for generations supplied the people of Athens with a steady income. They were state mines owned by all the citizens together. But three years before the Persians came, as if miraculously, the miners working in those, those deep silver mines struck a reef of silver ore. And from that, they struck coins. You see one of them here. They are nicknamed owls because they have Athena's owl on on their reverse and on the obverse, the helmeted head of Athena herself. Let us look for a moment at an, an ancient Athenian picture of these miners, because in a way we owe the victory of the Greeks at Salamis to them and they, to their endless toil and thankless lives. But let us thank them for finding the silver that enabled the Athenians to build an enormous fleet of triremes to face that armada of King Xerxes 
when the final climax of this collision between East and West occurred if it were not for the work, the, the hard-earned discoveries of these people, uh, slaves, probably men, women, and children in these mines. You can still visit Larion and go down those mine shafts today. The victory at Salamis began here. And in the mint at Athens, as I said, they were minted into the coins the Athenians called owls, with a beautiful head of Athena, their warrior goddess, on one, on one side, the obverse, and on the reverse, the owl, a little bit of Athena's olive branch that was her sacred tree, and that Alpha, Theta, Epsilon, which is the beginning of Athena or Athens. From Laurion then came the, the mass, there was a great strike of silver. It was brought into Athens, into the treasury there, into the mint, to be struck into those coins. And there was a great debate at this spot about what to do with that money. This is the Pnyx, that is uh, ancient Greek for a crowded place. And yes, it became very crowded. It was a bare rock summit then. It overlooked the city of Athens and its central area. And on assembly days, all of the thousands of citizens would go up and crowd themselves onto the top of the Pnyx. And they would take votes on what the city's action should be in war and in peacetime matters as well at this assembly place. And when the news of the silver strike came, there was a great debate, what shall we do with the silver? And for a while in this debate, the popular vote was, well, let's just decide it, divide it all among ourselves. Let us each go home with a, a new bundle of drachmas from this silver strike. And then the, the proposal, uh, before it could be voted on, uh, the, the action was interrupted by one citizen who had a different plan. His name was Themistocles or Themistocles, and he urged a different plan. From that rock, they could look out at another, at an island just offshore beyond Salamis called Egina. The people of Egina were independent, they were seafarers, they were merchant princes, and they were a big thorn in the side of the Athenians. They were rivals. And so Themistocles, knowing his fellow citizens could never concentrate on any threat as distant as the Persians, in spite of having just won the Battle of Marathon nearby uh, seven years before, he said, let us take this money, let us keep it all together and build ships, hundreds of ships, and we will, we will then have a great navy where we can punish these islanders of Egina and prevent them from ever interfering with us again. Well, the motion passed, of course, if he pro proposed fighting the Persians, I think people would have laughed at him. And the result was 200 triremes, new ones, plus the existing standing fleet of Athenian triremes, were ready three years later when the Persians came. It was with these triremes that my interest in that ancient world of these Persian wars and Athens' involvement was first stimulated. Back in the fall of 1969, I was a rower in the Yale freshman lightweight crew. That's, that is myself, third from the left in this, this photograph. And my head was full of triremes because I was taking a, a history course on ancient Greece from Don Kagan. And I had been looking up everything I could about ancient Greek rowers. And I found this famous image of the Lenormand relief. And one snowy day in that first year at Yale, I encountered Don Kagan on this sidewalk and he recognized me as a student from his Greek history class and asked me what I was doing at Yale. I told him rowing, and he said, well, you should study ancient Greek rowing and ancient Greek ships. I think there's a lot more to be learned about the naval side of ancient Greece. Well, I learned that that was an assignment for life. I'm still working on it today, sometimes with underwater searches in my underwater archeology span work in the Aegean. But my next stage, getting my doctorate at Cambridge, you see Trinity College there, I met John Morrison, who had just created his model of an ancient Greek trireme and published his epoch-making book, Greek Oared Ships. And he had, in fact, not only made a model of what a trireme really looked like, one of those ships that fought at the great Battle of Salamis, in fact, with Greeks and with the Greeks on the Persian side, because many Greek cities had been taken over by the Persians and fought for them. 
He made careful drawings of what a trireme would have looked like, its 120 foot length, its 170 oars on three different tiers, and its extra uses at time for transporting cavalry. Uh, here you see it with the, the cavalry leading their horses off the stern end of the ship. He then met a, a uh, maker of ships, a retired uh, ship maker, ship designer, naval architect from the Royal Navy named John Coates. And John Morrison and John Coates teamed together to create this first time ever in modern times workable plan for constructing a trireme. They first built a small model the size of a child's toy. They bought a child's swimming pool and set that afloat in it in John Morrison's garden and then built a section of a trireme as John Morrison had reconstructed it based on all the ancient evidence. And in time, uh, they set the swimming pool next to it. Here you see Mrs. Morrison at the top. She's in the thranite rowing position. Those are the only people with fresh air. That's an open window, as it were, next to her with the deck above her head. Then John Morrison and his grandson are in the tier beneath, the zygite rowers, the, the second tier. And way down at the end is the, the poor banker who is raising the money for all of this. He's at the bottom, the Thalamian third tier of oars. And when they got a that swimming pool put up, they, they invited all and sundry to come by and pull an oar. So this was my chance to take that place at the Thalamian oar and just have the first experience that we modern Westerners had had in centuries of feeling what it might have been like to pull an oar in a trireme. Now the triremes could not spend their night in the water. They had to be drawn up on a beach or in Athens itself into one of these ship sheds, these uh, Neosoikos, a, a ship house. And so I'm here when the BBC showed up to film all of this, and that's John Coates, the naval architect on the, on the right, and we are about to insert in its ship shed for the BBC cameras a trireme, so you could see the trireme both in the water and then drawn up in its berth, not just for overnight, but for the entire winter season. The Mediterranean, the Aegean were considered impassable from late fall to spring, so they had houses here that circled every ancient harbor. As a result of John Coates getting involved, a trireme was actually built. His name is the Olympias. I imagine some people who are listening to this celebratory presentation of, of Salamis Day have rowed in this trireme. And it was called, as I said, Olympias. And here we see it with its, its painted eye and its bronze ram forging away uh, through the seas with all of those oars on either side. Uh, it shouldn't have a painted eye. One of these eyes has been found at sea and brought up and preserved in the Athens Museum. And you can see it was carved of a, of a disc of marble, very thin, with a red eye like a bull's eye to indicate the, uh, the, 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 the iris of this, this magical beast, the trireme. And with its sails erected and its full crew of 170 rowers, with its, its officers on deck, and its, they left out the 10 Marines as hoplites, but it took to the seas, it caused a sensation, and it was taken out for very important sea trials that gave us a sense for the first time of how rapidly these triremes could have moved under oar because ancients had no stopwatches. They had no way to measure by the, by the hour in any precise way any speed. And they, they achieved a remarkable speed with these triremes. And here we see again the close-up of all of these oars being worked. That is the thranite tier, the top, they're the ones that get the highest pay, but they have the hardest work because their oars are at the sharpest angle to the sea. Below them come the Thalamian rowers. You see the, the Thranites at the top here. Sorry, these are the Zygites or Zuigite. They are in the, the second tier. And then way down at the bottom and out of sight are the, the guys in the hold, the Thalamian rowers right at the base, but almost right at water level. So their oars, in fact, are positioned to do quite a bit of serious pulling to move the boat forward. An extraordinary thing of beauty, but for enemies of the Greeks, terror as these triremes spread out across the sea. And so this Battle of Salamis that we are commemorating today was a collision between the biggest fleets of triremes on either the side of the east or the west that had ever been brought together in one place. And as far as I can tell, the, the largest number that ever would be brought together. The Greeks were battling for freedom. 
the Persians were battling for security on their western front and an ever-increasing expansion of their empire. As I may have said, it was the mission of the Persians to extend their empire till it reached the limits of God's own sky. Greece was only going to be a stopping point along the way. So having reached Greece with this, this sort of amphibious pro progression, uh, the fleet along the, the coasts of the Aegean, the army under King Xerxes coming down, passing through Thermopylae after three days of hard fighting, they reach Athens and they find the city deserted. They found the, the skeleton of a new temple going up to Athena on the, on the Acropolis and uh, inventions for a, an Athenian burning of a sacred site in Persian territory years before, they set fire to the sacred buildings on the Acropolis. And they didn't think this was an atrocity. They thought this was retribution for Athenian invasions and Athenian sacrilege of many years before. Out in the bay, watching this fire, were the Athenians. They had evacuated their city. They had evacuated their land. They had gone over to Salamis and to adjoining islands, and they had now become a city where the men were on ships. Though all those triremes that they had built with the money that they got from the silver mines, now three years later, that's their home. The men are in those ships. They land on the shore of Salamis to spend the night and to, to eat, but they're out in the Straits of Salamis during the day trying to protect them from that mighty, huge armada that the king of Persia has brought to destroy them all the way from Asia. Well, the great battle itself happened exactly 2,500 years ago today when the Athenians hold up in the narrow waters, which in this National Geographic artist's imagination aren't quite narrow enough. But it is true that between Salamis and the coast of Attica, the coast of mainland Europe, there is that, that narrow strait of, of water that, where the sea, the Aegean Sea, comes between the island and the land. That was where the battle was fought. And King Xerxes had a throne erected. He was not going to be on deck fighting, but he wanted to be there for his, his troops and his rowers, as we would say. So he had a throne set up on Mount Egaleos, which is on the shore of Attica, on the sh European shore, looking out over the straits. And there he watched all day long on this day, Salamis Day, in the shortly after the autumn equinox of that year, 480 BC, he watched the greatest naval battle of ancient times, ancient Greek times, and expected to see an immense Persian victory. Well, you can leave out the burning boats, that's the National Geographic artist's colorful imagination, but he did see an extraordinary naval disaster. Now, modern artists have liked to uh, modernize the whole scene, uh, this whole world. Here we see from, uh, from the, the, the subsequent film in the franchise after 300, uh, Themistocles of Athens challenging Xerxes of Persia. I don't think either one of them looked much like this. They were much more about getting the job done and sticking to business. At any rate, um, I, let's turn, leave it to Lord Byron, who I don't often quote, but I think these are supremely beautiful lines. His description of what Xerxes saw. A king sat on the rocky brow that looks over seaborne Salamis, and ships by thousands lay below, and men in nations, all were his. He counted them at break of day, and when the sun set, where were they? Where they were was shattered by the Greek rams, the Athenians leading the way, the Egonetans, those islanders right beside them, as they first in hard fighting pushed the Persians out of the narrow straits. And then when the open water allowed more ramming charges, they began to hunt down the fleeing ships of that Persian armada, none of which remember were Persian. They were all, as Xerxes would have thought of them, slaves of the Persians, maritime slaves, the conquered peoples of Phoenicia, of the Greek islands, of all of the coasts of his empire, all fighting inadequately on his behalf, in his view, and pushed them right out of the Bay of Salamis and into the open sea. The fighting was horrific. We have eyewitness accounts of it in the oldest surviving drama in the world. It is called The Persians. 
It is by Aeschylus, an eyewitness of this battle, as he had also been an, a participant at Marathon, and it is he who describes for us these unballasted triremes floating around on the sea, the, the corpse-strewn waters, the blood visible on the waves, the shattered oars. All this comes to us from an eyewitness. So this is one of the first battles in history where we know that a, the person who wrote down and described it for us actually saw and participated in the battle himself. Later Romantic artists have, have uh, thrilled in, in evoking this, this scene. I like this, uh, this um, von Kaulbach uh, painting from the mid-19th century. Uh, look up in the upper right-hand corner, you see gods and heroes arriving to aid the Greeks, and the Greeks did indeed tell Herodotus they had visions of divine forces fighting in their behalf. And then we see an extraordinary figure on the left. That is the one woman to be fighting, and she is from Herodotus' own home city of Halicarnassus. She is its queen, Artemisia, and she was there. And we see her here, this is my favorite part of the painting, uh, firing a bow at the enemy as she leads her little contingent from Halicarnassus. And according to Herodotus, in a fam famous moment in his book, Herodot uh, Xerxes shouted on witnessing Artemisia's sinking of a ship at Salamis, and not realizing it was it was another Persian ship that she was ramming to get out of for it to get out of her way so she could get clear of the Greeks. Uh, the memorable memorable statement: "My men fight like women, but my women fight like men." Artemisia must have been quite a person, and her dynasty kept on ruling in uh, Halicarnassus for many generations after this great great signal effort on her part. Well. As the crunch broke up, as the, the masses of ships began to thin out with some limping home on both sides with shattered oars or broken rams, there were possibilities for these more elaborate ramming charges, such as you see depicted here by this modern artist. And in the end, as the final ships of Xerxes' armada were pushed out, the Athenian triremes in triumph patrolled over the waters, picking up Greek survivors, probably spearing and killing Persian ones or trying to keep them for ransom, and salvaging anything from the wrecks that they could. And so this, this Straits of Salamis, which had been blocked by the Persian ships at either end, in the end, the, the outnumbered Greek ships, probably outnumbered three to one, uh, because of their superior rowing, their oarsmanship, and they, the, that Greek fighting effort in the defense of their own homeland, um, they managed to win the day at Salamis. And, and the Greeks recognized that Themistocles had been their savior. There was a tradition in the Greek world that you would vote for the, the, the person who would win the, the prize for the most valuable person at, in the battle. And uh, all the men had to vote for themselves first, but for second, they all vote for Themistocles. So I think this is a, a moment to then praise uh, this as yet undiscovered Greek trireme a personal holy grail for me as an underwater archaeologist, and I think for many others, because of its associations with this turning point in world history, this September day of long ago, when a fleet of these Greek triremes turned back permanently the seemingly unstoppable empire of the Persians. So now um, we're going to pose some of the questions to Professor Hale. Um, since we ended with Themistocles, there's a question about the importance of Themistocles besides just the battle. I think you did mention this, his importance in the silver coinage uh, going towards the ships. Um, and we know that after this battle, at some point after this battle, Themistocles was actually exiled. He was ostracized from the city. So I wonder if you could comment on um, why that might have happened. And also, um, how did he train? We're talking, what, 34,000 rowers, uh, 200 ships with 170 oarsmen. How, how in less than three years could they muster and train? And is this Themistocles who did this training? Uh, 
a Navy like that. <laughs> Thank you for both those questions. Um, I'm going to take the, the uh, second one first, and then Jennifer's going to remind me what the first question was. The training of the triremes was done by the Athenians by conscripting all the citizens. Remember, everyone in Athens who is a citizen is up for military duty. And the Thetes, the mass of laboring class, non-landowning citizens, they get their full citizen's rights because they are drawn into the fleet after Themistocles trireme bill gets all those, those ships built. Now they are full citizens. They, they need their rights. Ultimately, they will become in future generation heads of state, these thetes, these laborers. And they are taken out then to train all day by traveling to all of the coasts, all of the islands that Athens has liberated, but also that it will quickly turn into that great empire of its own. I stopped at the end of Salamis because it's a little bit depressing to see Athens turn into an imperial power as well, having liberated all of the Aegean Greeks, coast of, of Anatolia, Turkey, and right across through the islands to Greece itself. They then turn around and become imperial masters of those Greeks, demand tribute from them, um, maintain their navy through this, but use that navy as an imperial force. So I'm afraid my book, Lords of the Sea, recounts a rather dark arc for Athens from being a liberator to then an imperial a power of its own. So it's from all of this, this seafaring that they do, all of the feats, those, those landless citizens are out in the triremes all the time uh, during the, the eight or nine months of the year when the sea lanes are open. They are patrolling the empire, they are on diplomatic missions, they are, they are not doing the kind of athletic training that I did as when I was in the crew at Yale and at Cambridge. They, they didn't need to. They threw the people in the ships, they already knew how to pull an oar, and they were out on the sea doing the imperial business of Athens, whether it's liberating or collecting tribute. They are on those triremes nine months of the year as they patrol the empire. So that was the, the second question. What was the first question again? Can we go back? Um, it was uh, about Themistocles, and he, he was ostracized. I mean, in, in one of our previous webinars, we showed some of the ostraca for Themistocles. Um, so um, even though he was the savior of Greece, in one sense, he eventually was uh, kicked, out of, <laughs> kicked out of Athens yes. for 10 years. Yes. Um, Remember, Athens is a radical democracy, one person, one vote, which means that ultimately a majority rule. It, it's, it's not, we are not a real democracy. No, no Athenian would call America a democracy. We are much more like, like the Roman Republic. Representatives speak for us. That's not true in Athens. And when people got angry at leaders, they had a by the majority rule to get rid of them for a period of time, exile them. It was called ostracism after those little ostraca, those little fragments of pottery that were the notepads of the time, the memo sheets. You pick one up, you write the name of the person you most want to see get out of Athens for the next decade, and you throw it in a pot. They count the ostraca, and you find out you're the unlucky one. And it's one of the bitter things in Athenian history that Themistocles, I did try to leave this out of the story today, is going to be ostracized for 10 years, and ultimately he flees Athens. He has so many rivals there and people who resent him, and he ends up going to Persia uh, as the only safe place from his fellow Athenians. So these are the dark, final aftershocks of, of Salamis. But yes, they are there, and grown-up people, like, like the person who posed this question, do want to know about them and get the picture in its entirety. OK, thank you. Um, there's been some questions about the actual rowers themselves. What classes did they come from? And um, were, the, were the more aristocratic or citizen, say, rowers put at the top? And um, were those rowers on the top row in the outrigger more susceptible to weapons from enemy ships, whether it was archers or spears. Thank you. And I want to say that thanks to the miracle of this system we are using, I've already been able to receive some of these questions while the, 
the broadcast has been going on. And another person asked about that second question. And Jennifer, it's probably safest to ask them one at a time or I lose track. But the second question about those, those Thranites, as they are called, they are highest paid, they're at the top row, they are exposed to the weather, and they have the, sh the sharpest angle of their oars going down to the sea. That means it's harder work to work the oar. They are the most experienced rowers, but they get more pay and they have leather sheets that are lowered from that little open window you saw them sitting in, the, the, the Zugatai in the middle row, the Thalamians in the, in the lower part, they're protected by the ship's hull. A leather sheet is drawn down over what looks like that window that the, uh, the Thranites are sitting next to. They still work their oar under that sheet through the, the wooden frame, but they are not exposed to the, the arrows or missiles during a battle. Okay, thank you. Um, now there's a few questions about the, the, the ship itself. Um, you know, there's always been this debate about whether they were heavier and so more. Um, what, what's really interesting about this battle is that, that it's not a military battle where men are fighting men, but the ship is the weapon. And um, so it's used to ram other ships. Um, there's been some thought that the Athenians had not time to bring their ships out of the water. They were slightly heavier and waterlogged. That might have made them more effective. Some people say they were faster. And it's also been suggested that the ram was actually invented. Uh, this is an article uh, by Samuel Mark. The earliest naval ram might have been invented for uh, this battle. Um, can you comment on some of the, these technical aspects of the, actual, the Greek dry rams? Uh, let's start with the last question first, and then you are going to have to remind me of the string of one questions that preceded it. The ram, as a, as a function of a ship, goes way back into at least the geometric period of the Greeks, centuries before uh, Salamis and the conflict with Persia and Greeks. And we see uh, long ships, those long racing ships that were used for, for warfare uh, with these long pointed rams at water level. Uh, they almost have to have been sheathed in metal because it's something that thin hitting another wooden target like a, an enemy ship's hull would break if it were not protected by the metal. And the only metal they had that they could, that was strong enough, pure copper wouldn't do. So they would mix in that little bit of tin, typically with the shop copper, nine parts copper, one part tin, you got bronze. Bronze is tough. It's not as tough as iron, but iron would be too heavy and not as easy to model to fit on the nose of that ship. So the rams go way back, but unfortunately it's not till the classical period that the artists sometimes put the little line on their base painting that shows there's a ram, uh, a, a metal sheet over the ram. But I think even back in the geometric period, as I said, several centuries before Salamis, you can't have a, a wooden protrusion that thin without the metal covering. Now, uh, Jennifer, talk me back through the other two questions. <laughs> um, were the ships waterlogged and so he somewhat heavier? Um, then uh, some people say that that might have made them more effective in ramming. No, the in fact, ships. the Athenians uh, and all Greeks with triremes, and they got this, I'm sure, from the Phoenicians who are credited as the uh, inventor of the trireme, they pull them up on the beach out of the water every night. And through the winter, they are kept in those special ship sheds. So they do not spend the night in the water. If they are on a long voyage, such as to Egypt, they will land hop along the coast all the way from port to port, from island to island as stepping stones on their way. And they want to get those ships out of the water every night so they, the hulls dry out and they won't become waterlogged. And that wretched little Pteridon navalis, the Torito shipworm that bores into wood, it breaks its life cycle if you pull the ship out of the water every night. Okay. Was there another question in that one? I think that, I think that was it. I think the, the question was more specific. It was, was, is that three, is the, that special ram that we see um, where it's, it has the, th the three kind of blades or levels on it, was that an invention of the fifth century in Salamis? Or was, um, I mean, was that a more effective ram? And I know you're going to find one one of these days and we'll have a real answer to this question. <laughs> 
Thank you, Jennifer, for that confidence. That would be a personal holy grail. At any rate, the, the famous triple ram on the Atlet Ram, which was found actually off the coast of um, uh, the, the east coast of the Mediterranean, uh, off the coast of Israel, uh, that is a later, uh, tending toward late classical Hellenistic period. You saw, if you've seen any of those geometric bases, they come right to a point. I, I don't think they had that triple thing, that sort of Poseidon's trident, the three three prong thing out front. But there was a, a tendency toward grandiosity in these ships. When you get to the great Hellen Hellenistic monarchs and in places like Rhodes, they were putting these monster ships together. Triremes is uh, three rowers per unit. They got up to uh, Ptolemy Philopater in Egypt, uh, ancestor of Cleopatra, who put together a 40. We now realize it was a catamaran, two 20s put together. But to have multiple men, rowers, with a single oar, and all those guys are being counted, not the number of oars, but you've got you've got 20 guys within a section of a, of a, of a ship pulling perhaps on four or five oars. Um, I think they were more for show, the, the monsters, but they did get up to the, the penteres, the, the quinquiremes, as the Romans called them, and those would probably have been two, two, one, uh, and those were very fast ships. Those were the go-to ships of the Roman navies, the quinquiremes. So more, more uh, human power, more, more oar power, uh, than a Greek trireme had, and probably much more carrying capacity. So it's a fascinating story. Uh, the great John Morrison, who I showed in, very, in, my, in my presentation, had the great honor to meet, led the way with Greek oared ships. I urge everyone to uh, read that, but our uh, wonderful American uh, naval historian Lionel Casson has also written very important studies of this. So it's, it's a world unto itself of studies about ancient technology and ancient warfare. Um, why have we not found any of the um, uh, ships or any remains of these ships? I mean, there were so many in this battle. I know, I know, many of the Persian ships limped away, but uh, clearly many must have been sunk. And is there any reason why um, the Straits have not produced? Jennifer, uh, evidence? my child, triremes don't sink. They are not oh, ballasted. Sorry. The only things oh. that, I didn't mean that in the sense of a child who doesn't know anything. I'm just referring to your eternal youth. Um, they don't sink. When they are rammed, they swamp. But they are made of wood and they don't have ballast. And the ram isn't heavy enough to carry them to the bottom. And they have all these oars and the, uh, the, poor, the poor mariners who are, um, are now in the water, they just grab an oar and use that as a life preserver to carry them to shore and the ship floats around. And after each naval battle, the winner will go through the floating wreckage of the battle with their ships. And if they see a ship where the ram can be salvaged or the ship itself could be salvaged, they will tow it back to shore. So um, yes, it's my, my holy grail, one of them, to find a, a, a trireme ram. We have from, the, from, from larger vessels like that Atlet ram that many of you know but a triremes ram, we don't even really know what it looked like. Um, there's been some talk about um, the, the Athenians or the Themistocles, perhaps, um, using the winds um, in the straits uh, to their advantage. Um, have you looked into that or know anything about the, the impact of the winds? I don't even know about the currents either, but the, the winds in particular. The only element of the winds playing a part that I know of comes from a Delphic oracle where uh, in, at some point in the Persian Wars, uh, I believe it was the Athenians who sent to ask, how can we survive? And the, and the Delphic oracle said, pray to the winds. And in fact, uh, Xerxes, or maybe it was Darius, one of the Persian kings before Salamis sent an invasion vessel and they were wrecked, invasion fleet, and a great storm of wind came up and wrecked them on that Mount Athos promontory in the far north of the Aegean that I showed the spike of land sticking out into the sea. Um, and that's why Xerxes cut the canal because the prey to the winds um, warning from the, or, or uh, advice from the Delphic Oracle had been proved true. Uh, it was a great storm that, that, sang that sank that previous invasion fleet. But that didn't in fa affect anything at the, the Battle of Salamis. Now, wintertime, remember, is the, 
you get out of the sea with your triremes and, and your galleys, your, your longships, because uh, from October on through March, uh, through April in some years, it's just too windy and too rough for these ships with their oars so close to the water to get out of port. I know you're a naval historian, but um, the, the Persian campaign is kind of a coordinated land and sea effort, as they, you showed us how they moved around uh, the Aegean. And um, likewise, for the Athenians, and, or the Greeks, I should say, I mean, there were land battles. And um, of course, after Salamis, there was the final battle of Plataea. So do you think that these were coordinated efforts, um, or do these separate branches of the military act independently? I mean, how coordinated uh, were, and how effective would this coordination have been? It's as, if, it's as effective as Greek and, and Aegean geography will allow it to be. But uh, one reason that, that Xerxes cut that canal to the Athos Peninsula, where his father had lost some ships in a great storm, uh, was so the fleet not only would be clear of the point of land, but be closer to the, the great ancient road that ran right along the coast of the mainland there, and, and keep that connection that was so important in Xerxes' mind, and the, the mind of Mardonius, his commander-in-chief, and all the Persian high command, that, co that coordination between this sea force and that immense army on land and again, at, at Thermopylae, that was hard to do because it's, it's hard to bring all those, those ships one at a time through the tiny Euboean channel between the island of Euboea and where Thermopylae is. So um, the forces of the Persians themselves were a, a logistical nightmare. You look at the paper strength and you say, oh, Greeks outnumbered three to one. But the bigger the Persians get in this unfamiliar territory to them, the more problems they have to overcome from nature itself. Um, there's a question. I know it, it, there was a um, there, there was a ruse involved on the part of Themistocles to lure the Persians into these into this rather tight and uh, you know uncomfortable um, area that we see on the back of the screen there. Um, and I think Artemisia, if I recall, had told him not to fight this naval battle, that it was a bad idea. Um, but why, why was Xerxes so um, willing to be, uh, you know, um, engage in battle? And why did he trust this, this uh, uh, message from the Greeks that they were, about, you know, that they, this fake message that they were about to leave? Right. What Jennifer's referring to is a story that uh, the Persians were told, this is one of the cunning acts of Themistocles, to pretend that the Greeks are going to flee away. And so the Persians needed to come into the, the, these narrow waters to prevent their escape. Well, that was, I guess if they'd sat down for another day and analyzed it, the Persians would have realized that's crazy let them free, flee away, and then we'll just take the land and seacoast of Attica unopposed and hunt them down to their next position. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how much to believe. Remember, Herodotus is writing, he can't interview most of the participants. It would be like writing the history of World War II starting in 1960 and, and, and talking to old timers who, who had been in the battles, and but mainly their children, telling you what they heard from the older family members who had fought. So um, I think we get the broad uh, pictures uh, of the action. Xerxes, we can follow his invasion very clearly. For battles like Salamis, we get individual uh, vignettes, uh, glimpses. And that's why Aeschylus is so important. He was there. And Herodotus fills in lots of pictures that Aeschylus doesn't give them, but Herodotus is a couple of generations later talking to the, the offspring of the people who were alive at the time, at Salamis in some cases. So Aeschylus should be our true guide, and um, he doesn't get into many details outside the battle. So remember, his is reported as a messenger speech to Queen Atossa, uh, Xerxes' mother back in the, in the palace in Persia 
uh, who he brings the terrible news of, of Salamis. So um, it's, uh, we just can't get too specific based on the sources we have about all these details. We would really like to know uh, exactly what happened. Thank you. Um, you know, these waters around Greece have been the locus of many famous battles, not just, of course, Salamis, between East and West. I mean, the Battle of Actium in 31, we had the Battle of Lepanto in 1571, and then the, for the Greek War of Independence, the important Battle of Navarino in 1827. Um, th th this seems to be an area of confrontation. And so one of the questions, or a couple of these questions, want to know what, what lessons can we learn from the Battle of Salamis, um, and how does uh, this um, relate to uh, current naval policy, American naval policy. Um, the ambassador alluded to some of this in his talk. I wonder if you have any comment about that, about how we might learn, what we might learn from Salamis. Um, uh, my two lessons from Salamis are leadership matters. Long-term leadership in designing strategies in advance. Remember, the Athenians start three years before the battle building their fleet thanks to what? The leadership of Themistocles in proposing the building of those ships allegedly to repel the Aeganetan threat, but Themistocles is thinking ahead to the inevitable return of the Persians after they had been temporarily halted in what was really a pretty inconclusive battle at Marathon with almost all of the Persian forces leaving unbeaten. Um, so leadership matters. And the second thing is, Unity of purpose matters on the part of what we will call the home team, the outnumbered ones who think it, maybe it just can't be done, but we are going to do it. And I think Athens and the Athenian citizenry was more of a unity in that perilous time leading up to Salamis than it would ever be again. Uh, there was something about that rallying together, supporting each other, uh, the city became like a big family. Everybody joined together in a common effort. Um, and that carried over into later of Athenian activities where they would free slaves and give them citizenship so they could become members of the fleet. Um, it just, it, uh, there are times when war, terrible as it is, can bring out the best in a person or in a nation. And I feel like the Greek defense against the Persian invasion in 480 was one of those times. Well, you've made a very good case for that in your lecture tonight, and we appreciate it. And those two words um, that you concluded with, leadership and unity, are good lessons for all of us in the world today, and especially in an election year. So um, I want to thank you, John Hale, Professor John Hale, for presenting this wonderful program. I want to thank all the um, messages we got from the chat and the Q&A. And um, this lecture will very soon, probably within 24 hours, be put on our website of the American School of Classical Studies, ascsa.edu.gr, um, where you can watch it again or send it to anyone who missed it. And um, we have much more to come, so please stay tuned to our website for all of the forthcoming webinars that we will be doing um, in the month of October. Thank you. Mm -hmm.